Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here this morning. My name's Ian Rye. I have the privilege of being the CEO with Pacific Opera Victoria, and I want to thank each and every one of you for making this Sunday morning uh, for opera and music. I also want to thank John, who's over here with a camera. Uh, John captures inside opera every production uh, for the viewing pleasure of the Opera Bus patrons. Our new Opera Bus has four additional stops. We have two buses, one that starts Courtney Comox, one that starts at uh, Schwartz Bay. And we pick up people from the mainland, from the Gulf Islands, and, uh, and coming down from up island, we stop in uh, Duncan and Imo and every stop in between. So if you have friends and colleagues who need opera up island, tell them they don't miss a thing. They get to see Robert online, his pre-show chat, his inside opera while they're watching on the bus. We drive people to the Sunday matinee and back again. <laughs> Thought I'd share that with you. It's a fun project and well done. Applause for Nicole. This, is a, this has been a meaningful um, service to uh, regional Vancouver Island and Gulf Islands and the mainland and it has become ever more popular. Um, this uh, production of Cosia Fan Tutte is our first international co-production. You will uh, begin to see in the small print, this is a production with four organizations. It premiered in Paris at Théâtre de Champs-Élysées. Uh, it is a co-production with Paris, Cannes, Victoria and Tokyo. So, very exciting. It travels, it travels to Japan following its premiere here in Victoria with a almost all Canadian cast. You'll be introduced to some voices uh, uh, at the performance who you know and some voices you don't know. Uh, so a really exciting and thrilling ensemble that we're bringing together. Um, and all of this work, of course, is thanks to you, this incredibly supportive audience and philanthropic community and our many sponsors, including our production sponsor, Butler Brothers, and our production patron, which is uh, in the memory of Doreen Moser. I want to thank them all of our supporters in, uh, in this community, large and small, and every attendee. Um, we have a, a, a new program that I will tell you about, uh, our ticket access program. If you have friends, colleagues, and uh, uh, relatives who, uh, for whom price is a barrier, uh, have them reach out to Pacific Opera. Our ticket access program now works with 45 community organizations, everything from the Victoria Native Friendship Center to the uh, uh, North Park Community Association. And we provide free and accessible tickets for all people through these programs and a really, really meaningful uh, launch. Uh, supported by a very, very generous uh, family foundation here in Victoria who prefers to stay anonymous, but who uh, really uh, believes in uh, uh, making the art form and the arts accessible. So don't hesitate to reach out to us or your local community organization to let them know about the Ticket Access Program. We are bringing on partners uh, every week, it seems like. Um, next, uh, we're going to be announcing next season, the 23-24 season. You will see in your mailbox and at the theatre uh, next month. So please join us next season. It is so critical for us to have your loyal patronage. We really encourage subscriptions because it uh, not only uh, 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 ensures us that you're in the house, but also means we can bring you some savings and the best seats as well. So thank you for considering that for next season. Um, I have one more uh, uh, selling pitch before we bring on the main event this morning, and that is the Friends of Timothy concert. May 15, we will celebrate 43 years of opera with our founding artistic director, Timothy Vernon. A concert with uh, an extraordinary panorama of Canadian singers, the Victoria Symphony, and the Pacific Opera Chorus. So a really thrilling event. There's ticket prices from low to high and seats at the McPherson Playhouse. We'd love for you to come and join us, celebrate Timothy and his extraordinary accomplishment in music in Victoria, in Canada, and beyond. Um, lastly, as you are leaving the event, I'll remind you of a new installation at the Bauman Center. As you know, public art uh, here at the Bauman Center began with Carrie Newman's Mind, Body, and Spirit in the ceiling above you, which you can read more about Carrie's artwork here. But the second installation is by another founding artist with Pacific Opera, Carol Sabaston, who joins us this morning. Her work, Remains of Madame a Butterfly, is on display as you exit the Wingate studio up the stairs on the right. The signage is there. Just take a visit uh, to this piece. Uh, there's also a written uh, panel about its inception. Uh, I will give you a little preview. It is uh, created in uh, 1981 using the remains of silk fabrics from Carol's design for a Madame a Butterfly, for the Puccini. And it's a work that she has been displaying privately uh, uh, for many, many years. And, uh, and uh, it has now taken up full-time residence at the Bauman Center. So we're really thrilled and thank 
Carol for that incredible uh, accomplishment. But a work of art, uh, as you know, Carol being uh, 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 the tapestry artist best known in the province of British Columbia for, <laughs> for an extraordinary amount of time. It's thrilling to be part of your practice, Carol, so thank you. Um, thank you. I will ask you to applaud once again, uh, this time both for yourselves uh, and also for our, our main event. Um, please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Holliston the Great. <laughs> Thank you. Hello and thank you to everybody for being here. And also welcome to everybody who's coming to us from the buses from Up Island. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about Cosi Fantute, which is one of my absolute favorite works of, of, of music drama ever. And uh, so it's a pleasure also to be uh, looking forward to a new production of it. Uh, the very first time that this company produced Cosi was uh, 1991. And it's interesting, probably coincidental, but two of the leading performers in that became heads of voice respectively at the Conservatory of Music and at UVic, Ingrid Atrot and Benjamin Butterfield. So uh, they're still around, they're still teaching, they're still influencing, they're still singing. Uh, so anyway, I, what I'd like to do first is talk to you a little bit about um, what was going on in Vienna during this period, to put it into some kind of context. It's always a little challenging to put these together because there will be some of you in the audience who have seen Cosi and are quite intimately familiar with it, and perhaps a few who have never seen it or don't really know much about it. So uh, for, forgive me if I'm repeating myself or saying too many things that you already know. Uh, Mozart moved to Vienna in 1781. He had been uh, shackled. He, he felt very constrained by the working conditions in Salzburg, where he was born. And I think it's very easy to surmise from reading in between the lines of his letters that he needed to get away from his father uh, and just become his own person. And so the 10 years left to him were all spent in Vienna, uh, despite maybe a few trips elsewhere. And he was the great composer of those years in Vienna. Coincidentally, but also very importantly and significantly, the year before, Empress Maria Theresa passed away, and finally, um, Emperor Joseph took over the rulership of, of, of Austria, of the Austrian Empire. And he was, among other things, a very passionate supporter of the arts, and a very knowledgeable and sophisticated one. And he was one of these people who was able to spot a talent. He understood immediately what Mozart was and what Mozart could mean to Austria. And also the next person that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, Mozart moved to a Vienna that had a very large, thriving, successful uh, community of professionals working in the field of Italian opera. Now, if we go back just a few generations, uh, we could say the very same thing about Handel in London. And people have often asked, why would people living in a German-speaking community or an English-speaking one want to have as their principal form of entertainment Italian opera? It's a difficult thing to answer, but it was the number one entertainment. And when I say that, it's more like the movies than like the theater in the sense that uh, it had to appeal to a very, very broad audience of, of, of ticket buyers. Uh, that were often attracted not so much to the music but to the star singers and to just the great cachet of being seen at one of these fashionable places. So these composers had to be able to appeal to, um, well, the, everybody from the connoisseurs to, as Mozart said, the amateurs or the lay people. And it was to the great credit of both of those composers that they were able to do this in a language that they weren't brought up speaking. Now, uh, many people worked in this community and were very, very famous during the period. And this, of course, includes someone who I'll mention a few times, Antonio Salieri. <laughs> now, I'll, okay, everybody recognizes that name, and probably for the wrong reason. So, we'll, uh, so Mozart's uh, work in Vienna would have included teaching. It would have been it included uh, playing the piano. He was an extraordinary performer by all accounts. And so he wrote pieces for his students. He wrote pieces for himself to play with orchestra at public concerts. He wrote symphonies. But it seems that the, the, the genre he was most interested in and he was most passionate about from his childhood was opera. And so he gave us some of his most uh, cherished masterpieces in these genres during that 10-year period in Vienna. 
may I introduce you to three operatic genres that Mozart worked in? Because uh, we, al we always call them operas, but they were, they were categorized in his time. Uh, he wrote Singspiel, which is a German language opera with spoken dialogue instead of recitative. You all know that the two most famous ones are The Magic Flute and The Abduction from the Seraglio. Those were sort of bookends of Mozart's Viennese career, with the abduction being the first and Magic Flute being the last. And he also wrote opera seria. Now, that is the kind of opera Handel became famous for. Very serious subject matter, usually about emperors and empresses from far gone eras, um, and very formulaic. Uh, Mozart gave us Idomeneo, which Pacific, uh, Pacific Opera actually produced, and his very last work, La Clemenza di Tito. We don't do those all that much anymore today. Uh, the plots tend to be rather slow moving and static. And again, about characters that are very, very hard to care about. If it's, not, if, it, if it's not composed by the likes of Mozart or Handel, it's probably going to bore you to death. Um, so don't go. Uh, <laughs> then the one that allows for a great deal of flexibility in the telling of the story and in the subject matter, opera buffa, which literally means comic opera but certainly allows for, as any great comedy does, uh, moments of insight and poignancy, which you definitely have in the three opera buffa that Mozart gave us from his Viennese period. Now, there's no way we can avoid this any longer. We must meet the character of Lorenzo da Ponte. All three of these works, Figaro, Don Giovanni, and Così, were, comp were composed with the collaboration of Lorenzo da Ponte. I've got to tell you a little bit about him. Um, it means Lawrence of the Bridge. If David Lee never got his hands on it, that's what the movie would have been called. Uh, so <laughs> Lorenzo was actually born um, Emmanuel Baruch, I think. Uh, he was born in Cremona, which is a Jewish ghetto of, uh, of Venice. And when his mother died, his father became enamored of a Gentile girl. And the rules were that if a man wanted to marry, a, if, a, if a Jewish man wanted to marry a Christian woman, he had to um, be converted to Judaism, which uh, Lorenzo's father was quite willing to do. And his sons also had to be converted, so they all became Jewish. Uh, Lorenzo took that name because it was the name of the bishop who performed the conversion. Uh, so he became Lorenzo da Ponte with the idea that he would then be trained for a career in the priesthood. And so he basically was, was taken into the, priests, uh, the, into the school, Jesuit school. And there is nobody, I think, in the history of the Catholic Church less suited to being a Catholic priest than Lorenzo da Ponte. Um, first of all, his talent was for literature and poetry. He was very, very fortunate that one of his instructors was a, 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 a Jesuit who was deeply and passionately interested in literature. And he passed this on to this incredibly uh, enthusiastic student. And so that meant that Lorenzo wanted to compose poetry, not read psalms. And then he also um, had a highly polished sarcastic wit and a very advanced uh, set of politics. We would have called him a pinko today, very liberal and very dismissive of anybody who didn't agree with him, and probably dismissive of people who agreed with him, but not intelligently enough. And he had this rapier-like wit, which could offend very easily, the easily offended. Um, also, he had this kind of attitude, Wagner would have it later on, that the world owed him a living. The world owed him the comforts that he craved. Uh, so he, throughout his life, would very often run up these massive bills at all these places and just not pay them. So sometimes he had to leave town under shadow of darkness to escape creditors. But even more um, intrinsic to his personality was an insatiable love of ladies. And as you know, that doesn't go with being a priest. Um, also, <laughs> he seemed to prefer ladies who were already affianced or maybe even married. Uh, because that gave him the extra cachet of, of being able to cuckold somebody, one of his lessers. Uh, so sometimes he had to leave town under cover of darkness to escape um, <laughs> husbands and fiancés and fathers and uncles and brothers. Uh, so he's really a colorful guy. But it was because of the politics and the, and the rapier-like wit I mentioned that he found himself with a warrant for his arrest in Vienna. He had to get out of town. I've seen a picture of the dungeons where they would have put you. Uh, and it's basically <clears throat> a man-made cave in, in the basement of these uh, buildings. You would neither be able to lie down completely or stand up. 
And if you've got a sentence of seven years, if, in the unlikely event that you survived it, you probably would have no mental capacity left whatsoever. So he got out of town very wisely and, and on time. And he ended up in Vienna. And Emperor Joseph also noticed that there, this was a prize-winning type poet in, his, um, in his, his larger community. And he appreciated the talents of both Mozart and de Ponte. And eventually, de Ponte uh, got to work with Mozart. He was working with many other people, but they were able to produce The Marriage of Figaro. Already, that tells us a lot about both of them, because The Marriage of Figaro today, we don't see it as something subversive, but it was hugely topical, hugely controversial, and in fact, um, any performances of the play had been banned in Austria. You were allowed to purchase a copy of it, but you weren't allowed to put it on. So for probably the only time in Mozart's career, he embarked on a project of great magnitude with no guarantee it would ever be performed. But he must have been wily enough to know that Emperor Joseph would allow it to be performed because he respected the, the, the talents of its two creators. This ruffled a number of feathers in the Italian operatic community, probably including Salieri's, because effectively these two guys just jumped the queue. And when you have an established community working in a, in, a, in a profession like this, there are rules and processes and protocols, and Mozart, de Ponte, and it must be said, Joseph, shattered them all. Lucky for us. So Figaro got produced, of course, to great success. And then the two of them created Don Giovanni. This is interesting because of what they called it. Uh, Mozart refers to this and to our opera, Cosi Fan Tutte, not as an opera buffa, but as a drama giocosa, which means a comic drama. So he's emphasizing the fact that there's a lot of drollery in it, certainly. The basic plot is rather silly, but there's also a great deal of serious examination of human beings and how they respond to all sorts of situations that are challenging. So, uh, Cosi Fan Tutte's origins are impossible to pin down. Um, partly because an awful lot has been written about this opera and certainly about Mozart that was just pure fabrication. When Mozart died, as you know, and I want to say just a little bit now about Mozart's career in Vienna before we go on. When Mozart died, as everybody knows, he was buried in what was referred to erroneously as a pauper's grave, and nobody knows where his remains are. Um, and this is actually not really fair. Emperor Joseph had instituted a reform that, uh, in, that insisted that when people died, they were all put into graves which could contain several bodies, and they weren't allowed to be buried in coffins, only in shrouds. So they had to be removed from whatever casket had been used at the funeral to accelerate the process of decomposition and above all to conserve the valuable space in Austria. This reform was overturned very quickly by the aristocrats who liked to have their mausoleums and their large memorials, but we don't know where Mozart is. It's also been said that Mozart died uh, 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 impoverished, this isn't the case at all, and that he had been always overlooked in Vienna, that's not true. Um, we have records of how much he earned during his years in Vienna, and he was actually very, he was highly paid, he was highly thought of. Uh, he certainly made more than most average laborers or office workers or clerks. Um, it's just that he and his wife weren't particularly uh, astute money managers. But if we, if we translate that into our time, it would be like asking ourselves, how many married couples in their early 30s with a couple of kids have absolutely no credit card debt? <laughs> Nobody. So um, that's basically, Mozart was in a, in a bit of a pickle because during 1787 to 1791, the very period of Cosi Fan Tutte, uh, Austria was embroiled in a war with Turkey. And we know those are expensive. So funds coming from the aristocracy to fund the arts dried up a little bit and people people's attention was diverted from being entertained to being civil, and many people got out of Vienna, just for safety's sake. So audiences and funds were dwindling for everybody. It's just that Mozart hadn't put any away for a rainy day. That's why we have those uh, famous begging letters asking to borrow money from his friends. And in any case, his fortunes were certainly on the rise because his very last opera, The Magic Flute, was a stunning success. It premiered on September 30th of 1791, and Mozart died on December 7th of the same year. So he didn't have enough time to enjoy that. But it was definitely going places. Mozart was definitely going places. So now let's get to the subject of Cosi Fan Tutte. Uh, one of the legends about it has actually only recently been debunked by, by scholarship, by musical archaeology. And that is that the commission came from Emperor Joseph, who actually also suggested the plot. 
but apparently that's, that doesn't have a kernel of truth in it. Um, something else that has been pointed out, and this was discovered as recently as 1994, uh, is that the entire uh, libretto written by um, Da Ponte was given first to Antonio Salieri. And he actually managed to complete two little trios before he thought to himself, I don't think this, is, this is, isn't going to work. This isn't stage worthy. And so he abandoned it and gave the text back to Da Ponte, who then turned to Mozart. Apparently Salieri was a bit miffed by this, but he got over it pretty quickly. And so Mozart and Da Ponte set to work. Uh, now, of course, the this, this story is rather silly. It's very flimsy. It's nothing really important about the plot. What the plot does in this and many other works is simply provide a framework to allow the composer, the, uh, the, the writer, and us, the audience, to glimpse into human nature. After all, as I'm fond of saying, and you probably all have heard me say this before, there's a famous novel, and nothing much happens in it except a boy changes his manners and a girl changes his, her mind. Does anybody know what novel that is? Pride and Prejudice. Now, of course, other things happen. We get to know that family and those people incredibly well, and they're all unique individual people. The same can be said about Cozy and, in fact, the other Mozart de Ponte works. So um, uh, one other thing I, I would like to tell you before I go on a little bit. I like entertaining you. I hope I'm entertaining you with these little anecdotes. And this is one of my favorites about, um, about da, da Ponte. We'll just tell you a little bit about his behavior in Venice when he wasn't working with Mozart. Uh, apparently, he had got himself involved with a woman who was already engaged to another man. That was no, no news for him. But that very man saw Da Ponte in a cafe one day, holding his cheek very tenderly and obviously in great pain. So he went up to Lorenzo and feigned concern and said, what's wrong, Lorenzo? And Lorenzo said, I just had a tooth extracted. Now let's have a moment silent for anybody who underwent <laughs> dental surgery in the 18th century, my God. Um, and so he, this guy said, I've got just the thing. And he went home and came back with some ointment. And he said, put it on your tooth and it will be, the pain will go away. And it worked. And Lorenzo was so happy. Except luckily he, he went home and his housekeeper saw this and was horrified. It was a highly toxic boot polish. So yes, it did, and, and the pain had killed the nerves. And Lorenzo stopped taking it immediately, but it was too late to save most of his teeth. And also he suffered from intermittent gastrointestinal difficulty for the rest of his life. So you see these pictures of him with his gaunt cheeks, and he was still apparently completely irresistible to ladies. <laughs> so he'll have to get out of Vienna later. Um, but for the time being, Mozart and uh, De Ponte's opera Cosi Fan Tutte, the final of the three collaborations, was given its first performance on January 26, 1719. And then it had four more performances, and then Emperor Joseph died. It was very clear to everybody that he was very seriously and probably mortally ill, even in, in the, in, during the previous year. But a, a period of official mourning had to be launched, and so the, the opera was, well, all operas were just taken out of performance. However, between March and June of that same year, it was given five more performances. And I, I have to tell you, several sources that I consulted said that after Emperor Joseph's death, it was never performed in Vienna during Mozart's lifetime again, but it was five more times, and they, those are documented. So that's not a huge success, but it's not a failure either. The failure came after, it came later. And that is, if the reception was ambivalent, many, many people have had trouble with this piece ever since. Mozart's own wife said that, it, that, that the text provided by De Ponte was not up to her husband's usual high standards. Uh, and essentially, many people just found it either frivolous or insulting. Some people even went so far as to say it was repugnant and obscene. Uh, one of those people was Beethoven. But let's have, have a look at what Beethoven said. He said, Die Zauberflöte will always remain Mozart's greatest work, uh, for in it, for the first time, he showed himself to be a German musician. And Beethoven gets down to it when he said, um, our sacred German art can never permit itself to be degraded to the level of a foil for so scandalous a subject. And he was not just referring to Cosi Van uh, Beethoven very famously didn't believe that, that it, Italian opera could really be a vehicle for anything other than light, frothy comedy, which he thought Rossini did better than anybody anyway. 
So Beethoven was the first of the great geniuses to simply not get Cosi Cantute, I think. In any case, uh, Mozart, of course, died before he could ever realize that it's become so popular. But it, did, it, it didn't go anywhere in the 19th century. Uh, I'm going to get to that after we talk about the piece, and I'll play some examples and introduce you to the characters. So I said the plot was pretty flimsy. It's also been going around for centuries. Uh, it's an original libretto only in the sense that it's not based on a readily identifiable source like Beaumarchais' Marriage of Figaro or all the Don Juans that have been circulating around for the last four or five hundred years. Um, but the, the idea of wife swapping has always been an intriguing one or at least a salaciously appealing one to many writers. And that's basically what this is. There are two girls that are affianced, let's say. They're not married, but they are more or less assumed that they're going to be married to these two soldiers. And uh, their fidelity is put to the test, and the girls fail. The boys also are, are chastened and challenged by this process. Um, and that's all that happens. Uh, Timothy Vernon will point this out, that we're not 100% sure in the text or the music whether the couples go back to their original configuration or not. Um, I would say operatic tradition would probably suggest that they do, but I think we're justifiable in leaving it up in the air. But that's basically what the story is. Uh, so let's look at what, uh, who we have on stage. The opera is set in Naples. I was going to look this up and confirm it, but I had something else yesterday. Um, the two sisters are from Ferrara, and that is going to be actually quite significant. So there they are in Italy on the coast in the sunshine, these two sisters. They are named... Fiordeligi and Dorabella, and they live in a, in a house in an, on an estate with only their maid, Despina. So we'll get back to them in a sec. The first people we meet are two soldiers named Ferrando and Guglielmo, and they're with an older friend who's been through the wars, etc., uh, been around the block, and has obviously been stung very badly by his relationships with women. His name is Don Alfonso. And we meet them basically in mid-fight, in mid-argument, because Don Alfonso has grown weary of these two guys extolling the virtues of their extraordinary women. And he said, no woman has it in her to be faithful to a man. <laughs> Every woman has a price, and it's all low. So that's basically what, uh, Dupont, what uh, uh, Don Alfonso has to say about it. Now that brings us to the very title, Cosi fan tutte. I've got it right there. I'll, oh, here it is. Uh, Cosi fan tutte means, of course, thus do all women, because of the ability of, of it, Italian to transform itself from one gender to another. Uh, so if you pronounce it cosi fan tutti, that means thus does everybody. But tutte means thus do all women. That was what Da Ponte always, that was what Mozart always called this opera, but it, all of the Italian operas have extra titles. And this one is uh, Ossia la scuola degli amanti which means the school for lovers. And that's what Mozart always called it. Oh, let me get this right for once, especially since it's being recorded. Da Ponte called it the school for, lo uh, called it the school for lovers. Mozart called it Cosi Fantute. It doesn't matter. We call it Cosi Fantute. Um, and the actual phrase came from a, a scene in The Marriage of Figaro, the scene where the count is describing the antics of Carabino that he witnessed earlier that morning when he was skulking around um, Barbarina's house. And he's illustrating it. I, I lifted up the tablecloth, and there Carabino was hiding under the table. And here he's lifting up a bedspread in Susanna's room. And he lifts it up and saying, there Carabino was, and there Carabino is, hiding under the bedspread. And then that's where we hear him say, cosi fan tutte, because he believes Su Susanna's been carrying on with Carabino. Cosi fan tutte. They're all the same, these women. Um, so, a little bit about it from the piano now. So, as usual, there's a very energetic overture for Cosi Fan Tutte, and it, it quotes within it a little tiny motive we'll hear very close to the end of the opera, right before the Act Two finale. And that is when the boys have to admit. The girls are just like all the rest. Co, si, fan, tu, te. And this is the music, but we hear it in the overture first. And 
So that's just warning us. Um, of course, we don't know it until the whole thing's completed, by which time we've probably forgotten. But anyway, um, that's what it starts. And then we're plunged right into this argument that all the boys are having. The first thing that, that we hear is la mia dorabella capace non è. So we hear a girl's name within the first few words, and that's Ferrando defending his beloved from these charges from Don Alfonso. And then when his friend Guglielmo comes in, he says immediately, uh, la mia fior di ligi, would never ever betray me. So we hear the names of the girls immediately before we even hear the men address each other and give us their names. No, I leave this here. And so the men are defending the virtue of their girls against the pretty cynical um, admonitions of Don Alfonso until finally they get so sick of this, uh, or he gets so sick of it that he, he says, I'll wager you. You do whatever I tell you for the next 24 hours and I will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that your girls are no more capable of being faithful to you than any woman is being capable, uh, capable of being faithful to any man. 24 hours. So keep in mind, this all happens in, in 24 hours. Just like Marriage of Figaro did. Um, so the, they say, yes, we will. And they imagine they're going to have all this money and they'll celebrate and stuff. Now, has anybody heard of the opera director Peter Sellers? <laughs> OK. Yeah, he's a, he's, he is who he is. But his, um, his production that was filmed of uh, Cosi Fan Tutte is really funny for the first few minutes. Um, and it has the boys, they're in a diner. Uh, and it depicts Don Alfonso as a, a sort of embittered Vietnam War vet, which is probably a bit extreme. But keep in mind, this was written when there was a war going on. And there are uh, references to various different skirmishes. And certainly, the likelihood that the boys would go off to war is, is, is genuine. So anyway, in, in this, the, the boys become so enraged with Don Alfonso that they each take out one of those serrated plastic uh, diner knives and threaten him with him. That was, that's funny. It's not up, up to that level for the whole rest of the opera. But anyway, um, so it's, it's a comic situation. It's funny. It's genuine. And you will know by the end of this seven-minute scene how brilliant Mozart's recitativo secco is. And I wanted to bring that up simply so that I could remind you that the storytelling medium in this kind of opera is in the recitativo secco, which is when the singers uh, sing and declaim the text in, in speech-like rhythm rather than the metrical rhythms of ensembles and arias. And it's accompanied only by harpsichord. So it can move very, very quickly. And if you've ever been to Italy, you'll know that that's basically what, how they talk anyway. They sort of half sing. And they, they can get through their words very quickly. Uh, and then we can um, cogitate and ruminate and soliloquize about the dramatic situation during the arias. And the ensembles are somewhere between. So after we've had this, the boys have agreed, we meet the two girls. And I'd like to play you a little bit of their opening music because so often, until, uh, the, uh, until the challenge is underway, so often the girls are heard basically singing almost, not, not in unison, but at the interval of a third. So it's, it's lovely music. And the girls are, well, they're variously depicted looking at lockets or painting portraits of their beloved. But they're always talking about their boyfriends. And um, in a passage of recit that is unfortunately almost certainly going to be cut, uh, they, they tell each other's fortunes by looking at their hands. And I see an M. I see a P. I know immediately what that means. Matrimonio presto. <laughs> marriage immediately. So that's all they, they, they talk about. They go on and on and on about how wonderful their boyfriends are. 
Uh, and then in comes El Don Alfonso, and this is where it begins. He tells the girls that their boys are leaving to go to war. They're going to the battlefront, and they just have time to come and say goodbye. And here's where we get, um, and I, I've thought this since the very, very, very first time I ever heard this opera back in 1981, um, that the music is incredibly powerful and beautiful. And th at, at no point during the scene in which the boys say goodbye to their, to their girls, uh, is there any doubt that the love that they experience is genuine, that the pain of parting is actually genuine? Mozart infused this with some of his most beautiful music. Uh, but inevitably, they have to leave, and the girls are left bereft. And they say goodbye in a, in a, a little terzetto, or a little trio, that is among the most famous passages from any Mozart opera. And this has a, the... Um, the strings playing something that's meant to represent, I think, the placidity of the ocean. As they say, they beg the oceans, the gods of the oceans or whatever, to remain calm so that their boys can make it safely to where they're going. And uh, they're joined by Don Alfonso. And I'm just going to have Nicole play this for you. And I think you've probably heard it before, and I think it's justifiably one of Mozart's most celebrated creations. So that's pretty astoundingly wonderful, isn't it? You've all heard that before, I'm sure. And it, it's I mean, even people who don't like uh, Cozy, at, for whatever reason, still love that music. Uh, and so that gives us a conclusion to the scene. And um, after this, we will meet another character. But I want to say one other thing. At this point, there's a little, sort of little tiny arielet. Uh, Don Alfonso himself never really gets a full-blown aria. All the other characters get a couple, at least. Um, and they get fantastic ensembles. Don Alfonso, we realize, is, uh, he's a bit misogynistic. 
whatever happened to him, he, he, we, we don't really learn what happened to him, but whatever happened to him was left him pretty bruised and battered. Uh, so he's not just, there's something darker than just good humor underneath Don Alfonso. As I'm sure if you've seen this work, you'll agree. There's something rather malevolent about him. Uh, and anyway, you'll learn that in a very brief one-page little song. And then we meet our sixth and final character. This is Despina, the maid. Uh, and Despina is depicted just being by herself, preparing her, maid, her, her ladies, her mistresses, that's the word that she uses, her mistress's breakfast, with it, which is hot chocolate. So these two sisters are living with apparently no parental supervision whatsoever with a maid that just feeds them hot chocolate. Uh, <laughs> and she's never allowed to have any herself. So since the, maid, since the, the mistresses aren't there, she tries some. It's delicious. So that's the life of her. She's a drudge, and she has to look after these rather selfish women. And in they burst into the room, wailing and act, carrying on and acting like uh, uh, Greek tragedians. And Despina says, what's wrong? And it's Dorabella who answers first. At this point, the sisters start to take on completely different personalities from one another. And Dorabella's is at the height of drama. This is the drama queen to end all drama queens. Uh, and she basically says, leave the room, leave me alone. I don't, I, I hate everything about the world. I hate the, the light, the air that I breathe, even myself. Um, and she says, who could dare console me in my grief? Nobody in the history of humanity has ever felt, this, has ever been so wronged as I. Now, this is an example of a recitativo accompagnato, when the whole orchestra gets in the game to punctuate the utterances of the character. Now, we for many years used English translations uh, when Cosi Antutti was presented in an English-speaking country. And the words that she has, uh, Ruth and Thomas Martin, have given us for this are, away from here, for in my state of frenzy, I might do something desperate. Which strikes me as absolutely right for her. <laughs> and the orchestra just does stuff like this. I might do something desperate. Shut the curtains. I hate the sunlight. I hate the air that I'm breathing. Even myself. So she's basically, go, she's really, I think, enjoying this very much. <laughs> and then she has an aria. She says to, 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 the, to her sister and to her maid, Fuji, flee, get out of here, leave me alone. And then she starts talking to them, because of course she wants her audience. Um, and there's something very telling about the, uh, the orchestral accompaniment when the aria proper begins, because all the violins are playing off the beat, and very fast. They're never together, and not 100%, even on many uh, professional recordings. Um, perhaps at the Met they are, etc. But I don't think they're supposed to be. They're, they're supposed to sound frenzied and confused and out of control, just like Dorabella is. That's, that's her inwardly. And so it goes something like this. Well, she's going on and on and on about the furies and the humanities and making all these classical illusions, so just to put her suffering into a context that is worthy of it. So it's hugely enjoyable and magnificently over the top. Now, so that's Dorabella. That's a glimpse of Despina. I'll tell you a bit more about her. Um, but of course, then the boys come back in, and the boys are now dressed as Albanians, did I say? Yes, Albanians. We don't find that out that they're supposed to be Albanians until the end. And directors don't feel compelled to observe this piece of stage instruction. So they'll come on in whatever disguise is cooked up for them. Um, I saw a student production that was quite effective. Where all they did was they went to the trick and joke shop and got those plastic noses and mustaches that were supposed to make you look like Groucho Marx. And it was actually quite funny. Uh, but in any case, this has also been something that people have felt was unrealistic about Cosi Fantute. Stop for a moment. You're going to the opera and you're talking about realism. Anyway, they, 
they said, well, uh, it's too stupid. The men come in in disguises and the girls don't recognize them. It's like, as you like it, Twelfth Night, any number, Fidelio of Beethoven, any number of works ask us to believe that somebody in disguise is not recognized. So we just take that. We just take that as we do when, um, did anybody ever see Carrie? That movie where she could move things about with her mind? You believe that immediately. There. So um, the boys come on disguised. And they uh, enlist the help of Despina, who also does not recognize them. And they say, uh, we've been in love with these two sisters so passionately and for so long. We can no longer control ourselves. We have to woo them. <laughs> And so that's what the boys are going to do, except they're going to woo the other's fiance. And uh, so the girls are called on, and they are horrified. First of all, they're furious with Despina for allowing two strange men into the estate. Uh, and they, uh, they're further furified, uh, horrified and infuriated by the, <coughs> excuse me, by the, um, the, the sheer gall that these two strangers would come at a time like this and profess to make love to them. Uh, so Fiordiligi now pulls herself up. And she is a very different person from uh, Dorabella. She is much more classical. And she's enraged and, uh, at these two men and will say in her recitativo accompagnato, the temerity with which you would assault our fortress and our persons with your trivial and unwanted protestations of affection. Now, one of the things that Mozart does sometimes is parody the conventions of opera seria. And this gives him a great opportunity to do that. And also, the rumor was that the soprano, who was from Ferrara and referred to as the lady from Ferrara, was somebody he didn't particularly like. And she had a technical, this would really be a kind of technical flaw. When she sang, when she sang a high note, her head would do this. And when she, when she sang a low note, her head would do this. So Mozart writes these, high low, high low, high low. <laughs> Um, th now, I think that the, th the thing is, it works so beautifully for uh, Fior di Ligi that I think any uh, intention for Mozart to make her look a tiny bit silly on stage is very, very minor. And, and it may not even be true, but I'm sharing it with you anyway because it's fun. So uh, then Fior di Ligi launches into one of the great arias, which definitely sounds like it could have come out of one of the opera seria, except it's better. Um, it's called Come Scolio. And she says, that means like a rock. We will be like a rock, like fortresses, uh, like citadels in the face of anything that you choose to, to bring to us. Um, and it has these ser uh, seriously celebrated wide leaps. Uh, it will be a, an aria that challenges many of the singers who attempt it. Um, now, I'm going to just play some of it from the beginning of the recitativo, Temerari, to the beginning of the aria, Come Scolio.
Thank you, Nicole. So that's pretty amazing, but do you think it's easy to do that? Um, would anyone like to know who the singer was? OK, that was Montserrat Cabaret. We don't usually associate Montserrat with Mozart, so I, I was thrilled to have this recording. This is the first recording that I ever heard Cozy on, so it's a favorite. The Dorabella, by the way, was Dame Janet Baker. And uh, the three women are fantastic in this. The Despina is played by the Romanian soprano Iliana Kotrubash. So it's a fantastic ensemble. The men don't fare quite so well, so I'm not going to tell you who they're, well, Nikolai Geta. Um, uh, uh, Thomas Allen, who's really good. It's a, and it's all uh, directed by Colin Davis. It's a, it's a good recording um, in the old manner, but also complete. More about that later. But um, good old Montserrat can really nail all those really, really difficult passages. Uh, so that gives us an illustration of the different type of personality Fiordaligi is. So they emerge as individuals now. Uh, and Despina also becomes a master of disguise. So there's the big disguises of the boys, but Despina will come on in the Act One finale disguised as a doctor. And the boys say that they've taken poison. So Despina, in a parody of a current quack physician named Mesner, who was um, uh, treating people with magnets, she comes in and draws the poison out of the boys using magnets. Um, and then, of course, the inevitable happens. In the act two, there are wooing scenes. But I wanted to show you a little bit more about Despina first. At the beginning of act two, Despina is upbraiding the girls for being so stupid. The boys are off to war. Do you think that they're not going to be f having fun with the local girls when they're over there? So why don't you do the same? Uh, you know, just, just have fun with the men. You don't have to be in love with them. Have boyfriends, have several. And then she has the aria that I think captures her. She says, any woman, she very much uses the word woman, not girl, any woman of 15 knows how to, how to wrap a man around her little finger. She can use tears, she can use laughter, but she can make that man her own for as long as she wants to dally with him. And she even sings la 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 in one of her arias. Very jaunty and very much the language of uh, a, a girl of this class and of this state of mind. She basically is telling the girls to, you know, get over it and have fun. And then she leaves the stage, and you are invited to make your own mind up as to what Despina really is. Um, I've always thought that efforts to make her every woman and to enlist actresses and singers of a certain age over, like, over 40, over 50, um, are misguided. She should be a girl of not much more than 15. She should at least be able to appear like that. No singer that young could get through the whole role. Um, but she's, she's a girl who's sort of, sort of been around the block and thinks she has much more experience than she actually has. Um, either way, either way, whatever you, you decide, there's no stipulation in this core that she, she should be a certain age, but I think she should be young and pert and um, not quite as wise beyond the years as she thinks she is. Anyway, then she leaves the stage, and I've got to share with you one of those priceless nuggets of Ruth and Thomas Martin's translations. One of the sisters says to the other, I am speechless at the girl's unbelievable badness. <laughs> Someone read that and thought, yeah, that, that'll do. Anyway, so the girls decide to indulge in a little bit of harmless flirtation with the boys. One of them says, I'll choose the blonde one, and I'll choose the brunette. And off they go. And so these flirtations become more and more serious. Uh, Dorabella is won over very quickly by Guglielmo. And then the boys start to have differences too. Guglielmo says to Ferrando, who's absolutely heartbroken, he says, well, what do you expect? I'm Guglielmo, after all. <laughs> I'm a baritone. Um, so a th much lengthier uh, uh, flirtation, a wooing, really, um, occurs between Ferrando and Fiordaligi. And I've just got to tell you that Fiordaligi's second act aria is every bit of, a, of the masterpiece that, um, 
her first act one is, and it's so similar, this is just this is a little bit of esoteric stuff, it's so similar to the aria given by Beethoven to his heroine, including the use of horns, that he may not have liked Cosi Fantute very much, but he liked that music and he pinched some ideas from Mozart. <laughs> uh, in any case, Fiordanigi is ultimately won over as well. And this is where it gets really interesting. We have not at any point ever seen those two couples in their original configurations doing anything together except saying goodbye during a time of stress and sadness. We've never seen their wooing. We've never seen their going out on dates. So this is the only coupling that we know. And it's genuine. It seems to us to have worked. Uh, so, of course, the time comes when they're going to get married. And the, the boys have both been defeated. Uh, Don Alfonso has won the wager, and uh, that's when he says, they all say together now, co zi fan tu te and they set out to have their wedding. Now, a lot of the wedding music is wonderful. Despina, of course, comes on disguised as a notary to perform the service, <laughs> and she has this delightful sort of spewing of bogus Latin. Uh, and there's what's called a canon. A canon is just a round, like, Frere Saka or Marilyn, we roll along. But this one is sublime, and it's led by Fiordaligi. And she sings, as we drink this wine to each other, let's toast each other and put the past behind us. Remember, all of this takes place in 24 hours. <laughs> so I'd like to play you a little bit of that canon from the Act Two finale. Now you'll hear Fiordaligi, then you'll hear Ferrando singing the same music and words, and then Dorabella. Then you hear, <laughs> you hear Guglielmo, and he doesn't join in at all, he sings, I hope it's poison what they're drinking, those jades. So he's still pretty angry about what's gone on. So, in will come the notary, and at some point, we have to be interrupted by the military music that got the boys to war in the first place, and we are, and it goes like this. To the words sung by the chorus, which plays a very, very small role in this opera, Bella Vita Militar, the beautiful life of the military. Etc. Et so, of course, of course, they realize that the boys are coming back. Remember, this all happens in 24 hours, so it hasn't been a very long war. Um, 
And so the, 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 the disguised boys run out, and of course what they do is change into their original military costumes and come back in. And they're overjoyed to see their girlfriends again, and the girls are like, what are we gonna do? And, um, but then they see there's a notary, uh, like a marriage contract. And then they go back and look, and they have, see these, uh, these men's clothing. And they look inside a door, and there's Despina dressed as a notary. And uh, so all of this basically means that they have uncovered the plot, and the girls are tremendously um, begging for f forgiveness, et cetera, et cetera. And Don Alfonso says, look, I told you, they're all the same. You can ditch them and get two more. They're going to be no better. So you might as well stay with them. You seem to like them. Um, now, there's nothing in, this, in this actual words that says that, uh, that they go back to their original configurations. So some directors let us wonder. Some directors make it clear that they don't, and some make it clear that they do. All of the three De Ponte operas end with a little kind of moral that's tacked on. Um, but this one remains very slightly ambiguous. So you can draw your own conclusions depending on whatever you want, <laughs> as you like it. <laughs> so, as I said, this went into a kind of period of, um, of decline and then into a, 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 it was just simply not appreciated at all during the 19th century. I think it's important to remember that uh, the, the 17th century was much more permissive than the, sorry, the 18th century was much more permissive in its literature than the 19th was. It got pretty Victorian. And so some of these things that were referred to, even the things in Jane Austen, might not quite pass muster a bit later on, some of the situations. Uh, so that might contribute to it, and I think we should remember that some of the people may have found it objectionable because they found De Ponte objectionable. So let's see what happens to him. I see, he had to leave Vienna. He got married. And he and his wife moved to London. And there he operated a secondhand bookstore until the funds that he had to borrow to set it up were apparently never going to be repaid, so he had to get out of town. Um, <laughs> And he went to the New World. His wife eventually joined him there. And for a while, I think I might have read this wrong, or it might have been conflicting with other evidence, but I read that he ran for a while a hardware store in Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> a... Then he went to where he should have been, New York City, where he taught at Columbia University, Italian. He ultimately um, was partly responsible for initiating a new uh, Italian opera house, which really morphed into the Metropolitan. And he wrote his memoirs in not one, not two, but three volumes of essentially fiction. Uh, and he, he liked to claim that he had single-handedly put Mozart on the map. Uh, and he uh, wrote some very valuable manuals of, of Italian usage that are still consulted. And he died when he was almost 90. He was buried in a Jewish cemetery in Greenwich Village, but he was the, the, that was exhumed when they needed the property. Nobody knows where his remains are, just like no one knows where Mozart's are. There is a monument to him in Calvary Cemetery in Queens. So that's where Mozart's collaborator ended up. I think that's just about the best story. If you put that into a novel, people would say it was way too far-fetched. Um, <laughs> So not only Beethoven, but any number of other people found Cozy just, they, they thought the subject was too frivolous or trivial or too licentious. Um, Wagner went so far as to say not only was it trivialous, uh, trivial and scandalous, it was degrading to the romantic idealization of women. Yeah. Now, Wagner was in no position to criticize anybody <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, but the music, Although Wagner found it offensive that Mozart had lavished such, well, actually, Wagner thought he decided that the, the music was inferior. Uh, other people said, well, how could Mozart? It tells us something about Mozart's character that he squandered such beautiful music on this plot. So I'll tell you what, let's change the entire text. So they tried to make Cosi Fantute into something else, which and that never worked. But you know, it didn't get its first performance um, at the Metropolitan Opera, its first American performance until 1922. So the, 18th century, the 19th century passed it by. But more and more and more, it's had a slow climb to popularity and respectability. Uh, although even more than the other two De Ponte operas, it's frequently cut. But more about that in a minute. Uh, I want to read a, um, a description of it by a musicologist named Edward Dent. And this was from 1945. So we can say safely by mid-century, it's back on the boards. The best, this is the best, of all de Ponte's li librettos and the most exquisite work of art among Mozart's opera. It is as perfect a libretto as any composer could desire, though no composer but Mozart could ever do it justice. I think that's pretty safe to agree with that. Um, now, when I say it's very frequently cut, 
uh, it's long. And the opera traditions of the 1790s are very different, different from the ones we have today. You know how you're supposed to be in your seat before the thing starts or you won't be let back in. People would go in and out all the time. Um, and they may go to see their favorite singers, or any number of reasons to go to the opera, but our, this, the standard of audience behavior was probably less um, disciplined than it is today. And I'm just going to say this, because I know I'm preaching to the converted, uh, and you probably will have been annoyed by some of this too. This, the standard of audience discipline today is much less than it should be, as far as I'm concerned, when, when you go to the play or the opera and people talk while the actors are... I just thought I'd get that off my shoulders. And the other thing is, <laughs> at, you don't do this at operas so much as at musicals. Um, you experience people just basically chatting all the way through the overture. We don't do that at the opera, do we? And we shouldn't do it at musicals either. Anyway, for any number of reasons, they could be long. Also, they didn't have musicians' unions. Um, so we have, we have these strictures. And so the opera has to be cut, otherwise it'll go into really massively expensive overtime. Um, the, it, so the, almost the only way you'll see Cozy uh, uncut completely is to buy a recording of it. Um, I have nothing else to say about that. But I want to say one last thing about the cast. Uh, there are no small roles in Cozy Fantute. Despina may be a young girl, but she sings a lot. You need a really accomplished singer. You need accomplished singing actors. You need people who can negotiate and navigate their way through the rapid Italian recitatives. Uh, so it reminded me of something um, Zinka Milanov said when uh, somebody said to her, what's the secret of doing a great performance of Il Trovatore? And she said, oh, it's easy. You just need the four best singers in the world. <laughs> Something like that could be said about Cozy Fantute as well. Uh, so I think you're going, you're, you're, you're going to get a fantastic cast and a very interesting show. Uh, and I hope you enjoy your time with this wonderful, still slightly underrated work. Thank you very much for being here today. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the opera at the Royal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.